So uh, first of all, the head tips. Um, as a lawyer, we always want to be careful about what we really publish or what we talk about. So uh, I'm very thankful to the people who have uploaded information for free because I have downloaded they're the same for free. And of course, who wouldn't enjoy the freebies? But for knowledge sake, of course, I have uh, taken lots of contents online, uh, which was uploaded by them. So thankful to them. And then it's a head tip. And of course, a lawyer will always want to have a disclaimer in place, absolving his liabilities from whatever he says, whatever he does. So a disclaimer would suffice. Yeah. So I'm very clearly mentioning that I am the author of these slides, which have been published for only educational purpose. It do not reflect the views of uh, the government or any other individual for that matter. And I do not intend to criticize any government court or law enforcement agencies. I may end up doing so, but that would be only to show the lacunae or the gaps. Of course, I'll try to restrict myself for sure. But uh, of course, I need to be absolved from that liability as well. And as an author, I respect the rights of every human being. Now, before I take you, uh, okay, uh, I've already, uh, I mean, the ma'am, uh, I mean, ma'am has already given the introduction. So I am a, a founder partner of ICL Advocates, and I'm a co-founder of Indian Cyber Institute, and these are my contact details. <clears throat> Okay, so before taking you to, to the real forensics reporting part and the conviction part and how it is important, uh, how it should be appreciated, so on and so forth, uh, I would like to just uh, take you through uh, certain principles of evidence because finally it's forensically uh, examined evidence that is administered in a court of law, right? It is admissible in a court of law. But that particular piece which has gone to forensics is a piece of evidence. So uh, a few points about criminal justice jurisprudence. Uh, I've also taken the civil side uh, for the safer side. Of course, it's written criminal justice uh, in, the, in the title itself. But I've also tried to cover a few points on civil disputes as well, just to enlighten and uh, you know, uh, make aware the participants of the day. So criminal justice jurisprudence, as you all know, the burden of proof is on the prosecution to prove the guilt of an accused beyond reasonable doubt that is underlined. It has to be beyond reasonable doubt. So no single piece of evidence probably may ever get an accused convicted. Now, it's not an overstatement, but ideally there has to be other piece of evidence in absence of any. For example, in a, tra in a traffic offense, when you're driving on a highway and there is an, uh, there is an camera which you know uh, picks up the events that you were driving past. Now, there was no human intervention. There was no other piece of evidence available. Then solely on that, evidence which was collected by the cameras has to be believed. But otherwise, as it is mentioned, it is beyond reasonable doubt. So there cannot be any probability that there could have been other situation where the accused would have been not liable under the act. So that's why relying on a single piece of evidence may not suffice to get a proper conviction. But as I said, in traffic offenses, it's a small offense. And if, if there is only, only uh, you know, the camera, which, is, which does not have human interventions, then that can be a piece of a vital information uh, evidence. Otherwise, you need to have certain corroborative, certain uh, circumstantial, direct, indirect, documentary, or maybe uh, oral, uh, various types of evidence which are available. So they all need to be clubbed and it has to be proved beyond reasonable doubt by the prosecutor. As against that civil dispute, it is the one who complains the burden of proof lies on him to prove his case. So civil disputes, the burden of proof is on the plaintiff to prove his claims considering preponderance of probability. So there is to, that you have to just show that there is one more way of getting here or there. And in a civil dispute, you are through. A little bit of doubt. It's the same as beyond reasonable doubt, but here the words are written preponderance. There is, there is, no, there is, a, there is a prevailing probability of 
something to happen in a different manner or a different way. If you can prove that, that thing, you are done. So these are the two very important elements when it comes to criminal justice jurisprudence and civil jurisprudence. In criminal law, forensic science can help prove the guilt of an alleged accused. And ideally, it can also prove innocence of the defendant. Now, this is very elementary level which I'm talking about. We all know about this, but just a recap. So it can prove the guilt or it can prove innocence of the defendant. In civil litigation, it has got uh, a, a broad spectrum to look into of the legal issues to identification and evaluation of physical evidence. Now, general definition of what cyber forensics would be is collecting important digital evidence to trace, track the criminals through their digital footprints. So this second line again, you know, uh, envisages or maybe amplifies what I wanted to convey in the first uh, point itself. Forensic science technology maps to bind the crime with the criminal. Now again, I am going to ponder into that it, the opinion of forensics examination should be more of an opinionated and not judgmental. It's more of an opinion than a judgment. So judgment is finally taken by the court. And again, it is open to cross. So of course, I'm going to come to that point, but since it reflect, reflected at this point of time, I, I thought to just uh, put it in front of you. So forensic science technology maps to bind the crime with the criminal from the trails that are left behind in case of an incident. And we all know this very famous principle of Lockhart's, every contact leaves a trace. I was just speaking to a police officer here and we were just discussing uh, an IPS officer. And I said, sir, you can, even if you strangle me, I'm not going to give you my uh, Gmail, Gmail password. But by way of biometrics, you offered me tea, you give me a bottle of water to drink. I am sitting on a chair with my hands on the handle. I put my hand on the table. All these acts of mine are going to live biometric details on the surfaces of whatever I have used. And mind you, it's easy to recreate a fingerprint or a thumb, thumb impression. I don't want to go into the uh, criminology part, but so by way of biometrics, I'm leaving so many traces and that's why this is justified. Every contact leaves a trace. Now, every evidence should pass three stages. Now, this is as per the Evidence Act or the Indian Evidence Act, right? So, first is relevancy of evidence. Why is it important? Why it should be appreciated at all or why it should be even admitted by the court as a piece of evidence? Now, there are two things, facts in issue and relevant facts. Let me give you an example. Suppose today I am having fever and I went to the doctor to uh, show myself. Now we examined and he said that you need to go for an examination. Now the fact in issue is that I have fever and I need to cure it. What are the relevant facts we will look into? I go to last evening. I came at 8.13 p.m. at my residence. I came out from a rickshaw fully drenched because it was raining heavily. Now this is a fact and which is relevant too. I that I came by rickshaw is not a relevant fact, but that I was drenched is a relevant fact. Then I proceeded towards my elevator where my security <coughs> said, sir, you have been drenched fully. Now he becomes an eyewitness by way of giving testimonial evidences. It could be oral because he has seen me. There are CCTV cameras fitted near the elevator which have picked up my images and my, uh, my uh, me being fully drenched. Now this again becomes a digital evidence and again a relevant, a relevant piece of evidence. I went up to the third floor in my lift. It's a fact, but not a relevant fact. When I opened the lift, I found my neighbor waiting for the elevator to go down. And he asked me that, oh, 
you are fully drenched today. What happened? Now, again, this fact becomes relevant because, again, it's an eyewitness who is identifying and describing my facts. My doors, of course, the door is opened by my wife and she sees me again fully wet. It's a relevant fact. Again, an eyewitness comes in, into being. Further to that, I eat my dinner at, at, say, 10, uh, at 9.30. It's a fact, but not a relevant fact in this particular case. I slept at 11, again, a fact, but not a relevant fact. But at 10.30, I had a tub full of ice cream. Is a relevant fact. Because that could be the cause of my fever. Now, coming to the doctor, when I go to the doctor and he suggests that you need to go for an examination, I go, for, I go to a pathology lab. How I go is a fact, but not a relevant fact. But once I reach there, there's a CCTV camera which is picking up footages of how someone, uh, someone or, the, or the person at the pathology lab is drawing blood from me. So again, this become, becomes a relevant fact that I was there and blood was drawn from, from my body. And of course, then it is examined. Here comes the opinionated part and the judgmental part. Now, when the, the pathology lab issues a, a report, of a blood report, of course, it was a, a blood examination. So it will not say that you have malaria or you have dengue. It will form an opinion that there is presence of certain, certain parasites or certain disease in your blood. Now, it may so happen that my blood sample may not have the traces of, of that parasites at that moment of time. But if I go tomorrow again, it may show up. Now, I hope I'm not making it complex, but this is the way we uh, really look at the evidence, you know, which is, which is uh, I don't know, what is the role of evidence? To find the truth. At any cost, to arrive at truthfulness. Hence, relevancy becomes very important. Now, once the report comes, doctor, according to the report and the symptoms which I have, will arrive to a fact and tell me that probably you have got malaria or maybe you have got dengue. So facts, relevant facts, facts and issue, these are the important uh, things which are to be taken into consideration while appreciating electronic evidence. Maybe any evidence, I would say, but electronic, yes, because we are going to deal with electronic evidence. Admissibility of evidence, again, an important aspect. There is primary and secondary. And all you all would know about Section 65B of the Indian Evidence Act, which talks about as admissibility of electronic records, which are of secondary nature or which are copy of the original. Finally, the third step is genuineness of the evidence to prove, to disprove or impeach the genuineness. So it is untempered. The, gen, the genuineness is to show that the piece of evidence which is in front of the court is untempered, untainted, uncontaminated, and is full with integrity. Again, that is open to tests under the cross-examination by the defense lawyers. But ideally, this is a golden rule that these three have to be taken into consideration. Now, if a fact is not relevant, it will not be admissible. Relevancy precedes admissibility. Only relevant fact. Now, for example, I slept at 10.30 is not a relevant fact. Why the court will look into it? Court will look into it that 10.30 I ate an ice cream, which could have caused the fever. I'm giving you a very layman's you know, uh, language terminology. So please excuse me for that. So once again, we run the three points, relevancy of the evidence, and we cover the fact and issue in the relevant facts, admissibility of evidence, primary and secondary, and even secondary by way of a copy of the original by under section 65B of the uh, IT Act, Information Technology Act, and genuineness of the evidence, which is always questionable uh, to, the, to, uh, to prove the contents of a document. And I, I, I have a slide on that also, uh, how section three of the Indian Evidence Act now terms every electronic output as a document. So going further, proof is a fact that demonstrates something to be real or true. A very simple language. Proof is a fact that demonstrates something to be true or real. That I had fever and that the doctor measured it at, through his thermometer 
thermometer and he told me that you have about one degree of uh, temperature. It's a fact. Evidence is information that might lead one to believe something to be real or true. Evidence is not a proof in it itself. Evidence shows ways, tries to prove that something is real or true. Proof is final in conclusion. If it's not, then there could be no acquittal and there could be no conviction. The object of forensic science would be to ascertain proofs, not suspicion, which should be final and conclusive in nature. Having said that, as I said, it has to be more of an opinion than judgment because it is open to cross. Forensic reports are open to cross examination. So the contents mentioned therein are always open to questions. And there are various types of evidence which are available, as I said, solely relying on one piece of evidence, where, as I said, there is only one piece, you do not have a choice. But where, ever possible, you should have these kind of evidences also clubbed together to get an acquittal or maybe to get a conviction. So these are direct, indirect, circumstantial, I've got examples for the same, corroborative, oral, documentary, or electronic evidence may also be relied upon for ascertaining conclusive proof. Because it has to be, uh, the guilt has to be, uh, what you say, it has to be proved beyond doubt, isn't it? So if it is to be proved <coughs> beyond doubt, in a kind of prakari, as we call in Hindi or maybe Marathi, uh, it has to be proved in a manner so that there is a full proof, proof against the person who is accused or someone who is going to get uh, acquitted. Now, coming to a certain case study, so I'm just building it up from here. Electronic equipment store massive data, as you know. IoT is something which we, we all know about. Uh, so it has got massive data, which a normal person fails to see or observe. And in a smart home, everything is, everything we speak or all the actions which we perform, uh, the data is collected. And of course, put onto the servers of the, the ones who collect the data or the devices which we are using, which could be potential piece of electronic evidence for a fact to be proved, disproved or not proved. So all these can now be used as a piece of evidence against you and me to prove, not prove or disprove. Prove, disprove and not prove. And we will see how it is used in US and the Western world. In one of the judgment, how digital evidence outlives other forms. The, here the judge, you know, stresses on how important digital evidence is. In one of the judgment as pronounced by Madras High Court, the Honorable Judge observed that the photographs turned hostile, but photos spoke for themselves. So in a particular case, someone had taken photographs, but then he turned hostile, said, I have never taken the photos. But the photos spoke for themselves. The photos were showing that there was a particular act which was offensive. So he thundered and said, when humans have, for extraneous reasons, like the case at hand, failed to be on the side of the truth, because evidence is for finding truth, isn't it? So failed to be on the side of the truth. The evidence collected by machines like cameras cannot be kept out of judicial scrutiny on specious reasoning, on silly reasoning that a laptop or a, or a, a computer system can be hacked. Those simple grounds, you know, just mentioning simple grounds that it is hackable, that does not, you know, uh, give you and it, it, it is not open for investigation otherwise because Judicial scrutiny can be done of these cameras and these cameras output are going to live to outlive even humans. So for example, if I am a witness in a particular case and if I go to a court of law and I testify, now again, the case is going on and after four or five years or maybe six years, I again have to go and I'm re-examined again. I may have lost the particular part of memory which was very important for me at that point of time. There could be memory failure maybe due to age, maybe due to some sickness. But it is not so with electronic evidence, which is once captured 
and it is certified that is untainted, uncompromised, then it lives forever. You can make n number of copies from them. So humans may fail, but not the machines, especially when it's an electronic output. But the only challenge, last line, is that the evidence has to be untainted or untempered or uncontaminated. And that's why it has to be certified by a forensics expert, a forensics lab, vouching for the authenticity and integrity of the particular piece of evidence that is sent for examination. Now, there's a uh, case study of an implant. So I have put, uh, there are various body implants now and all are Wi-Fi enabled, they are attached to, uh, a computer system through an app. And of course, that app is always uploaded on someone else's server, uh, the provider's server, of course, uh, these, uh, these devices or these implants. For proving a murder case, echo was used as one of the evidence. Mother and daughter had a fight in the kitchen and loud abusive words used by the daughter were recorded by echo. Mother's scream were also recorded, giving away impressions that she was being murdered by her daughter. Knives, that's a murder weapon, found in the kitchen. Multiple evidences pointed towards the daughter's involvement together with other evidences. Now, in this particular case, there were CCTV footages of daughter coming at a particular time to meet the mother. Then the ECO is collecting the facts that there was some abusive words used. There was identification of the of the, the of the uh, of the spoken words of daughter and that of mother. So there were two ident that they had to be identified. Now here comes forensics. You see, to prove this case, forensics examination of the ECO and its data, which is uploaded on the servers of the provider, needs to be in place. The voice needs to be identified. I mean, there's a mother's voice and a daughter's voice. The act of killing probably could have made some noise because while shuffling the knife uh, in the mother's stomach, maybe she would have made those, you know, uh, those killing, uh, those killing and, you know, hurting noises, sounds. All these needs to be identified, need to be amplified, need to be segregated need to be looked into and examined and certified. This is the job of a forensics expert because without a forensics investigation, this murder case cannot be solved based only on you know, uh, voices. It could be, I can take out someone's voices, I can mimic someone. So it has to be proved beyond doubt, beyond reasonable doubt. Hence, we need forensics investigation to identify both the voices which were available on the machine. And again, the knife, see, as I said, it is not the only piece of evidence which is available through ECHO. There were murder weapon, which were uh, the knives, which, which were soaked in blood, which were, you know, uh, taken, uh, found over there. And there were evidences of CCTV camera that at that particular time, uh, daughter did come to mom's house. She was walking inside the house. And then, of course, before she left, the murder was committed. And there was no ingress otherwise. There was no entry of any other person otherwise. We all are using Echoes and Alexas, isn't it? See, a very interesting case. The Butler County judge denied a Middleton man's request not to use data of his pacemaker as evidence at trial. Pacemaker as evidence. What are the facts? Ross Compton allegedly set fire to his house in 2016 for charge with aggravated arson and insurance fraud. 400,000 damages dollars, of course, by way of, law, by, by way of damages. He claimed that he was asleep and upon noticing that there was fire in his house, he packed and threw certain bags from windows and left his house. Now see his contention. He said, I came to know that there was a huge fire at my house. So I just picked up a few belongings, uh, which were important to me, packed them, threw them through the bags out from the window, and I also jumped out of the window. Now look at the evidential part. The cardiologist obtained data from his pacemakers, heart rhythm, 
spatial demand in cardiac rhythms before, during, and after the fire. The cardiologist determined that it is highly deplorable that Mr. Compton would have ever been able to collect, pack, and remove number of heavy items and exit his bedroom without giving his medical condition. Uh, window, given his medical condition. Now, this is the first case of a beating heart being, you know, monitored and used, uh, the pacemaker used as an evidence. But again, after collecting the data of this so-called pacemaker by way of heart rhythm, pacer demand, and cardiac rhythms, it is yet to go for forensic investigation, and it is a forensic examination alone, which can identify that this pacer, this pacer had these qualities or these parameters. It was in uh, Mr. Egg, uh, Mr. In, uh, Mr. Compton's heart. Various parameters are to be looked into. The data and the logs have to be confluenced, appreciated, so that the comprehensive report, in a way conclusive, though opinionated, but in a way conclusive, needs to be drawn up by a forensics expert. Merely by, because otherwise from the pacemaker, how are you going to know the heartbeats or the rhythms or, or the pacer's demands of cardiac rhythms? Forensics investigation plays a very important role and it is only through those reports. And of course, uh, other, you know, uh, if, there, if there was CCTV cameras, or if there was an intention of EP, if, if he insured himself just a week ago or a month ago, he raised the insurance of, uh, of fire, fire, et cetera. So then that could be more, giving more probability that he was the one who himself had, you know, uh, set fire his house. Pennsylvania criminal case at trial level, Commonwealth versus Risley. Uh, Miss Risley complained that she was raped by an unidentified male intruder in middle of the night at her house while she was uh, sleeping. Now she is alleged rape by an unidentified male intruder. An officer asked for a permission to take a Fitbit that was fallen on the ground. Now she you was using a Fitbit as you know, it's a wearable device, uh, which was, uh, you know, on her hand, but probably it fell off and that came to the notice of the, and, uh, the, the police officer. And he, of course, uh, took her permission and uh, said that I need to look into this Fitbit. So she obliged and in doing so, the case turned against her. According to the data of the Fitbit, Zisley had been awake and walking around during the time she claimed to be asleep in bed. See how, how a false statement made by her, a false allegation and a, and a very darkonic one made by her can be just disproved because the, pay, the, the, Fitbit, the Fitbit, which is available and which records the steps, etc., showed that she was walking. She was not asleep in the bed because the rhythm changes. And if you have a, 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 a very high-end gadget, then it records your heart and it, it records so many parameters of your body. And it was also said that heartbeat should have gone up, anxiety level should have gone up, but nothing was found. She was cool and calm at the, at the alleged time and date. The judge ordered her to complete two years of probation and 100 hours of community service. Charges against her, raising false alarm because she called up 9-11, tempering with physical evidence and making a false report, though being first-time offenders. That there was heavy snowfall. See, again, corroborating evidence was also available that there was heavy snowfall on that day and time, date and time, and no ingress was recorded on CCTV foot, uh, message or footages. It was a conclusive proof enough to nail her lies. Again. Getting information from Fitbit, from the wearable device, and again vouching the same for its correctness, examining it forensically, and then drawing up a report. And that report to go with the electronic evidence to make it admissible in a court of law is so very important to prove or disprove or not prove a particular fact. 
a slide or two for examples. Hurt in an accident, the Canadian law firm represented a young woman who was hurt in an accident. To demonstrate the extent of her injuries, a lawyer used Fitbit to, to measure activity levels after the accident. Again, here the Fitbit was used to measure her daily activities. And what were the results? The results showed that her activity level was less than an average woman of her age and profession. Hence, her compensation claims for higher amount was corroborated. How lawyers are using these kind of variables also by way of a piece of evidence which could get more compensation claim is civil suit to the clients. Again, merely showing it on your variable is not going to happen. That piece of evidence is an electronic evidence and it has to have relevancy, it has to have admissibility and genuineness to get about these particular compensation clause. Or maybe acquittal or maybe uh, conviction of an accused. <clears throat> San Francisco attorney obtained data from a variable called Strava. It is just like a Fitbit. He was speeding and was responsible for accident in, in, contro in controversy. So because smart cars have different sensors that collect various data. Today you have cars which collect so much data and they exchange data. Those datas are there somewhere in the server, right? It is collected somewhere, processed somewhere, so that input process output is always there. So how these kind of Fitbits and various sensors now available in the car can probably prove or disprove or not prove something. So these were the examples of how forensics investigation plays an important role without which, see, merely making a statement is an oral admission or an oral evidence, which may be concorded, which may be contaminated. But when there is documentary evidence or electronic evidence, then the credence is more when it comes to weighing the piece of evidence. And electronic evidence, as I said, outlives all of the forms of evidence. If it is analyzed, if it is told in a manner which it should be, because we all know it's volatile. And as I said, you can make n number of copies. You can make n number of copies of what I saw. But what the CCTV saw, can, there can be n number of copies. There's a difference between human and machines. Finally, on the civil side, Alexa, a voice activated smart device used for controlling homes. The device recorded the private conversation between the couples and then sent it to a person on the context list. They did not do anything. It was done by itself. Amazon calls it the rarest of rare case. And the couple alleges total privacy invasion. Google, of course, stated very clearly that the, these devices were designed for false except also. So even if you don't say, okay, Google, these devices are always alive and always listening. So the hot word is, okay, Google, suppose. Even if you don't use that word, it would yet activate and probably take the commands. So here, of course, it was a privacy breach, which was claimed. Now, this matter we handled in a high court. <clears throat> a photograph was submitted before the court in a memory card and a pen drive as electronic evidence by the plaintiff. So a photograph on memory card was given to us. Data was copied onto another memory card by way of copy paste and not cloned. So on the next slide, of course, I've tried to differentiate the both. But what we got was a copy pasted photo and not a cloned drive or the cloned content from the said memory card and was handed over to the defendant. We were the defendants in that particular case. Prima facie, the digital evidence showed that both the photos were same because it was a copy paste. It could not be different. The defendants preferred to subject the said memory card for investigating it forensically by an expert. So we went ahead for forensics investigation to examine the same photograph. 
by use of forensics tools, it was proved that the said photos were loaded onto the editing software Adobe Photoshop. Now, Adobe got the sole distribution license in 1988 and copied onto a memory card that was further copied and supplied to the defendant. So, it was loaded on Adobe Photoshop, copy obtained in a memory card, and that copy of that memory card was given to us. Now, it was further observed that the plaintiff had contended that the photograph were taken in the year 1904. Adobe came into being or maybe went into live distribution in 1988. See the discrepancies? Just by running a simple tool of forensics, we could ascertain that as claimed by the plaintiff that the photograph, original photograph, which was taken in 1904, but the copy which they have submitted to the court or tendered to the court of law is supposed to be loaded, was supposed to be loaded on the software of Adobe Photoshop, which came into being in 1988. So that means the copy which we had, had the photograph after 1988, but not of 1904, which has to be the original piece of evidence. Hence, forensics report could prove the fact that the photos submitted by the plaintiff were not original. This just happened in about three, three or four months back in the High Court. So how simple forensics tools and a report could pave way for a better uh, logical, or, or rather arriving at a logical conclusion in a, in a better fashion, or more conclusive fashion. Now, I just uh, told you about something about forensics copy, the, the clone copy. Uh, of course, we had to talk about, talk about it in the, in the code itself. And uh, we had to really discuss that point, what, that what is the difference between a clone and a copy. Uh, just to uh, um, envisage, accused has a right to ask for forensics copy, not only a mirror image. What is a forensics copy? It contains all physical as well as logical data. So it would include deleted files, unallocated spaces, slack spaces, boot record, RAM, slack, metadata, so on and so forth. But a mirror is the same image. So what is there on my computer screen right now? If you take a mirror, you will get the same screen. So mirror image may contain only visible files. This was of course propounded and judged uh, and a judgment delivered in the High Court of Gujarat, Pravin Kumar Lalchan Shah versus State of Gujarat. At any stage, if an accused wants a copy, he has to be given a forensics copy and not a mirror image. What we were given in the earlier case in the High Court was a mirror image. A photo copied from, a, uh, from uh, Adobe, yeah, Photoshop. A copy was taken on a, on a, on a, on a drive or on a, on a memory card, and that memory card's copy was given to us. So it was a mirror image. Filing or admitting electronic evidence. Electronic evidence can be filed and admitted under the Indian Evidence Act 1872 as follows. If I give my original phone for investigation, then I can give it under section 62, it being primary evidence because it's an original device which contains the incriminating evidence that needs to be appreciated. But if I do not want to give my phone because it has got lots of data and it's a high-end phone, so then I will make a copy of it using a computer or a laptop. And I have a paper printout or if I have a CD or a DVD or I put it on a pen drive or an external hard drive, and I want to tender it in the court of law, then it becomes a piece of secondary evidence because it's a copy. It's not the original device wherein the uh, original piece of evidence resides. So if I make a copy and tender it in the court of law, I have to tender it by use of section 65B certificate. That is the only way of admitting a secondary evidence when it comes to electronic evidence. 
it's a simple certificate vouching about the contents of the the uh, the device, what all information and how it was fed, and it also vouches for the system. And it says that there was no unauthorized access. I was in law. I was in lawful, uh, you know, control over the system, so on and so forth. But this, it's merely a certificate. But that certificate, without this certificate, secondary evidence cannot be made admissible under the Evidence Act. So, if it's in primary evidence, I'm giving the original phone. I can give it under 62. I need not produce 65B certificate. But if I, if I from that, that particular phone, the original phone, if I make a copy on the SD card and I give an SD card by way of evidence to the law enforcement agencies, I need to give a 65B certificate because it becomes second, secondary evidence. Sorry. Forensics report should be more opinionated then being judgmental, I just told you. See, the report may suggest that the original photos match with the photograph that was subject to forensics examination. It can say it matches the parameters. But you should try giving judgments. Because, see, the, the reason being that such reports are yet open to be cross-examined by the defense. Because it is being signed and vouched, by a forensics expert, it need not necessarily be true. I'll give you an example. Suppose if I write a mail to you saying that you owe me 10 lakhs of rupees. I take a 65B certificate, even go to forensics and obtain a certificate from them that the email is, uh, the contents of the, uh, no, sorry, the email itself is true because I have sent you for sure. So the traces are there and it can be corroborated. Now it is admitted under section 65B because by way of 65B, I got it admitted. So that I sent an email from my account to your account is a truth. It's a fact. That I forensically, I got it forensically examined and I put it in front of the court using 65B certificate again is a fact and admissibility. But the contents, despite it being relevant fact and admissible, yet I have to prove the contents of the document, the contents of the email, which says that I, you owe me a 10 lakh of rupees. By merely writing and producing a certificate, certifying it through forensics examination does not give me the right to claim that money from you. I have to show how you owe me that money. What were the past experiences? What were the past exchanges? Was there an, an, an MOU to the defect? Was there an agreement? Did you give me as a, did I give you as a loan? I have to show to the court. So that evidence was relevant, admissible, but the contents of the evidence is yet questionable. So when we say forensic examination report is conclusive, it may not, because I have tendered wrong information. And I've got it certified. It's a fact that I sent you a mail. So it gets more complex when it comes to finding the truthfulness of the contents of a document, which needs to be proved. And section three of the Indian Evidence Act says that any electronic output is to be treated as documents. So just as we have a primary document and a secondary uh, document, primary evidence, secondary evidence, I can give the original or I can give a copy of an original. So also here, I can give an original under section 62 by way of primary evidence or through 65B certificate as secondary evidence. But remember, after doing all this, the truthfulness of the contents of the document has yet to be proved. That guilt has to be proved beyond doubt. Just because it is stated in the certificate, it cannot be gospel's truth. Now, a forensics report can be filed along with the charge sheet. A certificate under 65B may be filed together at the time, or it can be filed later at the time when the subject matter is tendered as evidence. So either with the charge sheet, it's better. It is said that you need to have 
you need to file contemporaneous certificate. That is on the fly. If I am taking a printout right now, which has to be made admissible in a court of law in, in, in a particular event, I need to certify then and there. I have to certify that particular date. It is called contemporaneous certificate. There can't be a time gap because these time gaps are taken very seriously by the, uh, by the courts. Third point, to vouch the correctness of the contents of the report, the forensics analyst should also file an affidavit to that effect. They are just vouching that we have filed under section 65B. This is the piece of evidence which has been tendered. Simple affidavit has to be also tendered together with 65B certificate for the evidence which has been examined by them and for which the report has been generated. In layman's term, forensically certified electronic evidence is like a licensed weapon, while any other evidence is like an unlicensed weapon. Okay, that was on the lighter side. Coming towards the end of the session. Examiner of electronic evidence as provided under the ITX 79A has made provisions whereby the central government may notify government bodies as examiner of electronic evidence. Now, there are these many electronic evidence uh, labs, which have been now certified under section 79A. So Cyber Forensics Lab, Air Force, Cyber Group, New Delhi, Army, Cyber Group, Forensic Science Lab, New Delhi, Directorate of Forensic Science Lab, Gujarat, Hyderabad, certain lab, a lab in Kerala, a lab in Bengaluru, Dharamshala, and serious uh, fraud office. So all these labs are now certified under Section 79A as examiner of electronic evidence because evidence which is in electronic form, there cannot be oral evidence to that effect. Neither there can be an expert opinion as envisaged under Section 60, uh, 45 of the Indian Evidence Act. Those who are into this field would know that section 45 is used when there is an expert advice. Advice is called in for any examination, for example, a doctor or an engineer or a scientist, depending on what is hand or what, uh, what fact is in hand to be proved or disproved. So section 45 does allow that. There is section 45 of the Indian Evidence Act which talks about straight that electronic evidence as provided under section 17 of the act will be relevant fact, not conclusive. See, these are bodies of the government. And despite being strong, I mean, have to be with strong credence, isn't it? Their finding, finding has, to be, has to be with strong foundations. But despite that section says, section 45 says an opinion of examiner of electronic evidence as provided under Section 79A of the ITA will be relevant fact, not conclusive proof. As I said, even when they certify and generate a report and send it to the court of law, it is yet open to cross-examination. They too may have to enter the box. So 79A provides for electronic examiner of electronic evidence. And of course, there are certified bodies now, government bodies, which are certified as 79A, even Hyderabad, yeah, Hyderabad, Delhi, New Delhi. So there were about seven or eight of, nine of them rather. Then section 45 talks about expert opinion, but not in case of electronic evidence, because section 45A of the Indian Evidence Act says, 79A can certify the electronic evidence, but, it would be only counted as a relevant fact and not a conclusive proof. Last slide. Illegally obtained evidence admissible. It's called the fruit of poisonous tree. Now, in Umesh Kumar versus state of Andhra Pradesh, it was or stated that if the evidence is admissible, it does not matter how it was being obtained. It is a settled legal position that even if any evidence is procured by improper or illegal means, 
there is no bar to its admissibility. If it is relevant and its genuineness is proved. So there was a case where husband and wife were fighting a divorce case. Uh, uh, the husband said, I do not have money for alimony and uh, I can't maintain you as well. So, and she knew that uh, this guy was earning a good amount and uh, he had a big fat, bank, a big fat bank balance. He asked a police, requested a police officer to help. The police officer in the guise of helping her or rather in, uh, rather in under humanitarian grounds wanted to help her. And so he sent a 91 ka notice to the, uh, under CRPC to the banks saying that this uh, person, this accused, is having bank account with you and is uh, in a cheating case and we are investigating so i will need his bank account details so bank statements were given to the police officer under section 91 of the crpc and he in turn gave those statements to the wife and in turn she put it in front of the court to which the opposition lawyer and the and the husband of course started shouting that this was illegal way of procuring bank statements which otherwise is not allowed it's an illegal act but the judge, now this is a family matter. So there are certain leeways also given under by virtue of section 14 of the Family Court Act. So by that virtue, the judge says that the documents were not, you know, procured for illegal reasons. And secondly, they were given verbatim, there were no changes made in them. They were not tempered with. And of course, on the basis of these documents, it could be proved that the husband had enough money to maintain the wife and give her relevant. So if an evidence is relevant and it's genuine, then despite it being obtained in an inadmissible manner or an unlawful manner, yet it could be admitted in a court of law. To this, this position, the US has an exactly opposite position taken where they say fruits of poisonous tree. So if the tree is tainted, the evidence, which are the fruits, are also supposed to be tainted and hence not admissible. I guess I'm through to the sides and I'm open for questioning if any. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, for, uh, sir, for wonderful uh, deliver. And uh, I'm sure that you have covered uh, every aspects of uh, forensic science, either the physical evidence or the digital evidence, and uh, you discussed with lots of case study. Now I request our chairperson, Subra Sanyal, ma'am, to kindly give concluding remarks. And I request all the uh, participants, if you have any question, you can drop the question in the chat box. And so that we can take after the ma'am Abhasing and Surasan Alman. Well, I, I, I think, you know, it was a very comprehensive, very comprehensive and informative uh, session of Mr. Jalla. But, you know, he has left behind a lot of uh, questions. I myself had one for him, but it is over time. We have exceeded our time. The point is, I wanted to mention, you know, you had mentioned repeatedly about the genuineness of the forensic evidence. Now, I have in mind the case of Shishan Singh murder case, where the clues were tampered, people have entered, CBI was not allowed to get in over a week and so. In that case, can you throw a light, sir? It is still under jurisdiction. They, what will happen to this case finally? Because yes, forensic being... science evidence is not leading anywhere. Again, uh, it's sub July, so uh, wouldn't really want to, you know, really yeah, talk yeah. about it. That, that, but, that uh, is not one, sorry, sir, that yes, is not one exclusive case. There are many other yes, cases yes, where yes, this yes, type, yes, and yes. this is the reason, this is the reason why we are insisting and emphasizing that whenever right. police goes, the CV, the forensic scientists should accompany the police so that, you know, right. they can preserve the evidences there. When you talk of genuineness, it does not remain when people are entering are intentionally tampering and distorting the evidences. Anyway, sir, your lecture has been very complicated. Right. No, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I agree with you, ma'am, on certain terms where uh, 
police officers uh, should be accompanied by a forensics expert and more so that uh, you get the authenticated and of course it starts from right from seizing to analyzing and to identifying and to storing and everything is less questionable like I yeah. don't want to name the lab, but I was sitting in a, in a uh -huh. big government lab where the hard disks, the police officers were bringing in newspapers. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. now, of course, it may have missed up change and they may have, you know, the, I'm sure uh, that was out of ignorance. But uh, due to ignorance of theirs, I guess so many of cases were either weakened or maybe have given, way, uh, given away. Uh, to the accused because lack of evidence would have been so I guess so, I guess if an expert walks in with a police officer I would say even to an extent a lawyer would also be important to a fact because hmm. uh, see most of the time I get uh, calls from deep Maharashtra interior Maharashtra about you know how to handle the digital evidence and what to take on record what not to take on record so an advocate I I guess comes handy when it's sometimes it is good to take everything on record, but sometimes it is it is also good not to take certain things on record. Now uh, that's that's the art of an advocacy. I don't want to really you know yeah, yeah. talk more about it, but some certain questions need to be asked, while certain questions need not be asked to a certain place. But so certain guess, questions have to be asked to bring integrity into the criminal right, justice system right, right. and give justice to the victim when it is needed. Right. I and, think you will agree with me there. And, and, and at times we even want to check the integrity of the witness. Sometimes the witness is not uh, yeah. um, up to mark and yeah. even he may be you know, falsifying the events or the sequence of the facts. Uh -huh. So we, we also try to cross-examine them in, in, the, yeah. in the court of law. So, as you said, rightly said, police officer to be together with the investigation officer at that relevant point of time. And thereafter, of course, approach a lawyer to formulate the entire, uh, you know, setup of having good decisions in front of you.